This video has been brought to you by the Landscape Certified Contractors Association. Due to the membership support, we're able to bring content to each and every one of you. If you have a topic or a product you'd like us to review, or if you want to become a member, visit www.irrigatortech.com and hope to hear from you soon. Enjoy the video. This is our next speaker now, but before I do that, I do. we did have a couple of arrivals uh, that came in late, a couple of elected officials I'd like to introduce. First, Brenda Denstead from Western Municipal Water District, if you can please be back to us. We also have Jack Coleman, the president of Ranch California Water District, Jack Coleman. Our next presentation is uh, from Juan Perez. Juan is uh, the director of transportation land management for the county of Riverside. Uh, he's been in that position since 2012 and has worked for the county for 13 years. The uh, agency has over 500 employees and oversees transportation planning, code enforcement, and building and safety functions in the unincorporated county. Uh, today, Juan is going to talk to us about the uh, changes to the proposed uh, water efficient landscape ordinance. Uh, this is something Juan has been working uh, with the water agencies on through the task force probably over the last year, maybe a, little, a year and a half. Um, Juan uh, comes from the transportation side of the business and public works side of the business, so he's graciously allowed us to indoctrinate him in water. Um, <laughs> and he's uh, taken, up, taken to it uh, very well, and he's really been uh, instrumental in leading this effort. It's been a great effort. Uh, and so I'm going to go ahead and turn the microphone over to Juan Perez. Please welcome Juan. So thank you, Paul. Uh, good morning. Thank you all for coming out. I have to disclose back in the day, uh, before I worked for the county, I worked for the city of Hemet. And uh, we did have a, a water company at the city. So uh, although I'm not uh, completely new to water, certainly it's been uh, more and more of a focus area for us. So. I have to say, Bill, probably, boy, that's a hard act to follow. That was the best uh, macro-level presentation on water I've probably seen. Uh, so thank you for, for setting the stage. And I think what I want to do is kind of now take it down to a little bit more of the micro-level. Uh, very micro in some cases, you know, micro-tubing and, and, you know, spray heads and those kind of things uh, that we're working on. And I want to thank the task force uh, because although this is a model ordinance that Riverside County has taken the lead on, it has been developed in close cooperation with the task force. And Paul, I want to thank you. you you've been the leader in kind of herding all the, all the different cats uh, during, uh, during this process. So, so um, let me, before I go forward, I do want to take a minute to step back. So water conservation is not new to Riverside County. Uh, I think Riverside County, and when I say Riverside County, I'm not just talking about the county entity, but really our water districts together. Uh, really have been leaders in this area, you know, long before there were uh, drought declarations. Uh, back in 06, uh, the county uh, set a uh, water budget uh, for new development of um, efficiency of about 80 percent. I'll talk a little bit more about what that means. And uh, a lot of that was done uh, through the leadership of uh, Supervisor Ashley, a very strong water background that uh, came to the board really looking to see how we could be more efficient in our water use. Uh, and, and at the time it was set uh, standards first for commercial, industrial, and, and, and multifamily. And then in 08, we transitioned to include uh, single family homes. And then in 09, as we saw the situation moving forward with uh, uh, need for greater conservation, we reduced that water budget from 80% to 70%. Uh, we also really uh, started working on looking at uh, recycled water. Um, a lot of the focus is on, on water budgets and irrigation and all those things are very important, but also soil management is very important. It's not just how you apply the water or how much water you apply, but what si type of soil you're going to have to be able to make sure that that's as efficient as possible. And then also things like the use of uh, smart controllers. You know, how, do we, how, how can we turn things off when it's raining? Common sense approaches to how do we use technology to maximize what we have. I do want to introduce Mark Hughes. Uh, Mark, raise your hand. Uh, he's, uh, he's our point person and our staff on our uh, landscape uh, oversight, uh, both for transportation projects and for, uh, for new development. 
So where are we today? So today, as I mentioned in the previous slide, the county's uh, water budget allows uh, about 70% of a, of a given area's evapotranspiration rate. That's a very long word for the amount of water that either evaporates or is used uh, through the root system in, uh, uh, in landscaping. So what we, the county is uh, looking to do, and we are planning on going to our board in July with a proposed uh, final action, uh, in keeping with both the governor's declaration and, and frankly good practice and good discussions that, as Paul mentioned, we've been having even before the governor's uh, drought declaration for for about a year now or so, is to reduce that um, water budget or ETO from 70% to 50%. Um, so if you take a, you know, if you take kind of a, a plot of land and then you say, we're gonna put turf irrigation on all of it, uh, that would normally use up, say, about 100% of the water budget. So we're talking about cutting that in half. Um, on a typical lot, that translates to about 30 to 40,000 gallons per thousand square feet of, uh, of turf grass that, uh, that is being replaced with other more efficient uh, landscaping. The other thing the county is looking to do, and I believe that, that we are gonna be a, a leader in this, is in addition to saying we are going to reduce the water budget that the landscape architects designed to, we're making a very strong statement in our ordinance that we're going to prohibit the use of natural turf in front yards for new development. Um, that, frankly, is going even beyond what the state uh, has uh, developed so far. But, uh, but our board uh, feels it's important for the county to really make a, a very strong statement of how do we move forward given the situation uh, and, and just not really have to look at a new normal for new development and how that works. And uh, one point that really hit it home for me as we were having discussions through the Water Task Force, um, and, and Bill and, and talked about this and Paul had too, is that there's a lot of efforts to, to replace uh, and a lot of funding uh, through Metropolitan and other sources to replace front yards. So we really don't want to be adding to that by allowing new front yards that now still have turf. You know, it keeps adding to that imbalance. So, so those efforts to do current turf replacements are, are very important, and we think it's equally important not to add to that, that burden over time as as uh, as growth happens. Uh, it is. I do want to point out that we recognize that there is a need, of course, for for turf and functional areas, uh, parks, sports fields, etc. Uh, although even those are becoming much, much more efficient, and, and we can talk more about that in the future. Uh, but we are talking about, uh, uh, about focusing on new homes and also commercial development. Uh, one thing I should mention is the state, uh, this is, as you can imagine, a quickly evolving area. Uh, the State Building Standards uh, Commission, which I believe is meeting on July 15th, it has come out with a proposal that, that is very similar to what you see here from the county. Uh, the, the difference is that they're looking to reduce the commercial <coughs> water budget even lower uh, to 0.4 instead of 0.5 or 40% instead of 50%. So what we want to do is see what happens uh, if there is an action on July 15th before we move forward with the final ordinance uh, amendment and see if we need to make that change. And our ordinance will be structured so that the more um, restrictive, if you will, of either the county standards or state standards, or if individual water district has standards, would apply. Another uh, important area is recycled water. Um, currently, the, the county uh, hasn't set a cap on recycled water. We're, we're recognizing that recycled water is, is water, and it needs to be conserved as well. Um, at a county level, we're looking to uh, reduce or set a budget, if you will, to, to 70%. I think individual water districts, I believe, uh, Eastern has adopted a 50% standard, Paul. So in cases where the individual water districts um, have a different standard than those would, again, that are, that are stricter, those, those would apply. Uh, but on a countywide basis, and, and the, the challenge for us at a countywide basis is we're dealing with probably hundreds, I would say, of water suppliers. 
I don't have the exact number, but it's a very large, you know, cover everywhere from, from the, the Colorado River to uh, uh, Western Riverside County here. So, um, so in some cases, individual water districts will have even more uh, restrictive measures, but at least on a countywide basis, we want to say at a minimum, we want to uh, set a 70% uh, threshold and reduce uh, and create a water budget for recycled water. So, in addition to these water budgets, and we talked about it, affirmative statements like, like prohibiting uh, turf and new development front yards, um, we are uh, also saying that uh, for commercial industrial projects that really should, uh, for the most part, should not have functional use. Functional use is where you, know, you have a need for turf or a playground or what have you. Um, we are, are really going to uh, discourage that and, and not have a new turf or new commercial industrial development. Um, and we're putting uh, an affirmative statement also in our ordinance that uh, we're not going to be allowing new turf in medians uh, or parkways. Uh, a lot of the, and the parkways being the area between the, the curb, if you will, and the block wall or the side of the road. Uh, the, the, uh, and again there, I think the, the county is going beyond the state because the state is focused on medians. Uh, we really have been ahead of the game as far as medians go. Uh, back in about 09, uh, we stopped having turf on medians. Uh, I'm a road guy and I don't like turf on medians because what happens? You got to irrigate it and then guess where that water ends up? It ends up on the road. And then we got a deteriorating road and now we got to pay not just for the water but for the road. So it's just not a good marriage to have turf on medians for a lot of different reasons. So we stopped, uh, we stopped that, but now we want to make a very uh, affirmative statement that not only do we want to not have it on medians, but also on, on parkways. And if you can see some examples there, uh, you can do extremely attractive uh, landscaping. Uh, many, of, many of you drive through, through the desert communities, uh, just beautiful, gorgeous landscaping can be done that's very aesthetically pleasing without having turf. So there was a question also about uh, gray water. And I think this is, this is an area, I, I firmly believe that, that innovation is gonna play a very key part in what we're doing here uh, collectively. Uh, we do, are, we are encouraging, and we are looking at uh, different systems, uh, including uh, gray water systems. Uh, there are some systems now that will take uh, water from, uh, from sinks, for example, from showers, uh, from the washing machine and uh, put it into outdoor irrigation. Uh, that may make sense in some cases. Uh, in other cases where there is already a robust recycled water supply that already provides water to public landscaping, maybe it makes less sense. So it's not a one size fits all. It really, it's really gonna vary area by area. Um, but there's a lot of innovative things I think we can do with gray, gray water. One of my favorite examples, I spent some time in Idlewild um, recently and there is a uh, there's a brewery going in there it's not open yet so i wasn't at the brewery uh, but i was just touring a future brewery that's going in there and uh, they were talking about how uh, it takes a lot of water to produce beer right and lord knows we don't want to stop beer production it's very important to the national economy so what this uh, brewery is doing uh, they're being very um really forward thinking and they're setting up their own great water system where they're capturing the water used in the brewery process to put back into their landscaping, okay? So I think that's a great example of how innovation, you know, something I would have never thought about, uh, can really be a game changer and really make a difference. Uh, and I think we're gonna see more and more of that. Um, and we're seeing uh, with every challenge, there are, there are creative opportunities and we're, we're hearing more and more from different industries and, and you know, different folks that are being innovative and how do we use less water. Uh, we have a pilot program um, going in, in the high grove area where they're using um, underground or subsurface uh, drip to irrigate turf. Uh, rather than you know, the traditional spray method. Uh, this is something that we're not quite ready to say across the board, you know, this is, this is fine, because I, you know, we do want to look at how that works over time, frankly, because there are some concerns about how well that'll hold up, is there long-term maintenance? Uh, last thing we want is there's brown spots and there's people still out there, uh, you know, watering to make up for the brown spots because we allow the turf. So, but my point is, those are the types of uh, pilot programs that are out there that we're gonna be evaluating. 
Um, the other thing the county is actively looking at is how can we uh, make more usable space? Um, you know, and, and this, I think, has a lot of other societal benefits, even in a loan to, to, to water. And, you know, the old, uh, can we do porches? Can we do patios? Do we really need that, that sea of, of turf to separate us from our neighbors, from our setbacks, right? Um, so, um, you know, God forbid, we may be having neighborhoods where you can sit out on your porch and you talk to your neighbor. Uh, so, so those are the kind of things we're looking at as well. And I mentioned the innovation. So we want to keep a very open mind because uh, there are going to be new products coming out and new ways to do things that we probably haven't thought about today. So this is, um, you know, I'm not going to spend too much on this, but uh, schematic of, of what um, what we're going to have with, with non-turf and, and new development front yards. Um, and it can be very attractive. Uh, you may not be able to get green year round, but you can still have green areas, okay? And um, I think uh, in a lot of ways it's actually going to provide for a, a much greater level of creativity uh, than we've seen in the past. Um, it's going to allow for a, a greater ability to create a sense of place in a neighborhood instead of just wherever you go, you've got, you know, grass, you're out there mowing. Um, so these are all examples, again, of, of drought tolerant uh, material. It may not look like this year round, but it, it, it can look very nice. Uh, it can be very functional. Um, it's it's going to, I'm a gardener myself, so I'd, I'd rather weed than mow, you know. <laughs> uh, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to put some creativity back into our, our, our landscape. And uh, it's also going to use uh, inert material. Um, so, so we are going to see more and more opportunities for using natural landscape, you know, the rocks uh, we have, uh, the gravels, those type of things, in addition to drought tolerant plants. So with that, uh, that's kind of a big overview. The board will be considering this um, coming up uh, here in July, uh, probably right after the, the, uh, the state acts on their standards. Uh, there are still some things uh, that the state is uh, working on that uh, even greater efficiency, not just in, in setting water budgets, but the design of irrigation systems themselves. That will have to get vetted and, and worked out. Uh, but, but Riverside County is moving forward in conjunction with our local partners to really uh, implement, uh, even though we've heard about urban uses being, you know, relatively in the large scheme of things, uh, a smaller percentage to be as, as uh, responsible as we can and conserve as much as we can at the local level. Thank you. Thank you. I, I want to again uh, express my appreciation to Juan and the county for taking lead and putting this together. They've done a great job and one of the things um, is that it, it, we've received a lot of input on this. The landscape architecture community, uh, the building industry, who's very interested in this, has really given a lot of positive input and support for this change in the ordinance. Uh, the local uh, land use agencies and the water districts really have come together to, I think, draft something that's really leading edge. I will tell you, we spoke about the change in the ordinance uh, to a uh, group of member agencies of the Metropolitan Water District, who will also cover four other counties in Southern California. And we're considered uh, kind of at the leading edge right now. And they're looking at our draft ordinance and considering making uh, similar changes at the county level in other parts of Southern California. So I think it's something you've done a great job on. I want to thank you very much.